Yu-Gi-Oh! True Duel Monsters Sealed Memories, otherwise known as Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, was released on December 9, 1999 in Japan and March 20, 2002 in America. Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories was a game that was designed from the ground up to run on better and more robust hardware, as it was released on the original PlayStation rather than Game Boy architecture. And because of this, Forbidden Memories was a game that had expanded upon its Japanese predecessors. Forbidden Memories heavily takes aspects from Duel Monsters 2, Dark Duel Stories, using the same card pool, albeit with two new exclusive cards. And since this was a home console release, Konami went the extra mile and had developed a full-fledged cinematic story experience for players to experience through, which was a first for a Yu-Gi-Oh game, since the other games before focused on battling opponents in an arcade-like style. Forbidden Memories was released in Japan during a time when the rules of Yu-Gi-Oh weren't set in stone yet, as Forbidden Memories decided to take its own spin on the formula and create its own rule set, based on the rule sets from the manga, with its own twist. So Forbidden Memories does have its own rule set, separated from the OCG. The biggest difference being that the gameplay is more oriented towards a Duelist Kingdom style rule set. In Forbidden Memories, the most apparent change is that any monster can be placed on the field without tribute summoning, leading to players being able to summon high attack monsters with no tributes. And you can either place that monster in face up or face down attack or defense position concealing information from your opponent, but you can only place one card on the field during your turn, no matter if it's a monster or a magic card. However, you can activate cards that are already on your field if they are already set. Similar to Duel Monsters 2, players will draw until they have 5 cards in their hand, and the reason why this is important is because the biggest change in this game revolves around the way that fusion summoning works. In this game, you can combine any number of cards in your hand to make a stronger monster without needing to commit to the board first. And due to this, the combination mechanic in Forbidden Memories is one of the most integral parts of the game, due to its nature of letting you dump cards in your hand to draw new cards next turn, or to fusion summon powerful fusion monsters to make a comeback. Another thing is that the alignment system that was introduced in Duel Monsters 2 still exists in this game, which is named the Guardian Star system based on the planets, and each monster is assigned two Guardian Stars. And in battle, when a monster with a superior Guardian Star battles a monster with a weaker Guardian Star, the monster with the superior Guardian Star gains 500 attack and defense in that battle, making some monsters essentially stronger against a specific pool of monsters. And with all of these aspects combined, Forbidden Memories creates a gameplay experience that's far more unique than any other Yu-Gi-Oh games that I've covered so far on this channel. And I cannot wait to dive in and see what this game has in store. Hey everyone, my name's Aisha, and it's no secret that I've loved the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise that has been running for the last 25 years. With Konami finally taking an interest in digital titles again, I decided that I myself wanted to go back to Yu-Gi-Oh!'s deep 20-year history and go over each game Konami has released over the years. And this is part of an ongoing series that I've called Road to Master Duel. And today, we'll be going over one of the most atmospheric and popular games Konami has ever made, Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. And before we begin, I want to thank every member of the Forbidden Memory speedrunning community for keeping this awesome game alive for so many years. On behalf of all of you, I'd like to take my own spin at this game, and I hope that you'll enjoy it. And without further ado, let's begin. The story of Forbidden Memories begins in ancient Egypt, where a man named Haishin is exploring the forbidden ruins of Egypt, where he stumbles upon an ancient manuscript which talks about the forbidden treasure of the ancient sorcerers. Due to this, Haishin starts laughing maniacally as he's about to hatch his evil plan. Sometime later, we are put into the perspective of the Nameless Pharaoh, who is about to go into the city and play card games with his friends. And right before he leaves, his mentor Simon Moran stops him and scolds him about going outside as he's royal blood. But the Pharaoh ignores him and runs away to go play card games with his friends. After sneaking out of the palace, the Pharaoh meets up with Teana at the dueling grounds, who is an ancient incarnation of Thea Gardner, and tells him that Jono left a few minutes ago. In the dueling grounds, there are a few opponents that you can choose to duel optionally before going to meet Jono, but they are all weak, so it's not really worth talking about. Teana tells the Pharaoh that Jono must be at the festival, which is currently ongoing at the moment. So both Teana and the Pharaoh go to the festival to look for Jono, and at the festival, Teana remarks about the negative presence of the High Mages, and states that the 
the whole vibe of the kingdom had changed for the worse. They then find Jono, who is currently dueling against Seto, and it seems like Jono is having a little bit of trouble in his duel, and he eventually loses to Seto. And after meeting up with Jono, Seto notices that you are watching his game, and he challenges you to a duel. But suddenly, Seto is called upon by the high mages, and Seto says he'll meet them later in the dueling round to have a duel. After that, you meet with Jono, an ancient incarnation of Joey Wheeler, who is also one of your friends at the time, and the three of you return to the dueling grounds. After some time waiting in the dueling grounds, Seto finally arrives and challenges you to a duel, and the two duel it out, with Seto eventually losing. After beating Seto, Jono was exceptionally happy that you beat him, and Seto leaves praising the pharaoh's skills. After this, the pharaoh returns to the palace, where he gets scolded and gets sent to his room by Simon Moran. A few moments later, Simon Moran is contemplating to himself in his room, when suddenly, he is alerted by one of the guards about trouble. The High Mage Haishin and his men have invaded the palace wielding the powers of darkness, and the whole palace comes into a panic, and Simon Moran confronts Haishin, who's come to claim his throne. Simon Moran then realizes that Haishin had stolen the Millennium Items, which were the forbidden treasure of their ancestors, and now Haishin is using them to wreak havoc on the people. At this moment, the prince tries to escape with his servant, but they are apprehended by Seto and his men who take the servant away. Seto steps outside alone with the prince, asking him why he's trying to flee, as he states that fleeing would provoke Haishin to end the lives of the current king and queen. Seto asks the prince about the location of the Millennium Puzzle, promising the safety of the current king and queen. Then suddenly, a badly beaten Simon Moran calls out to the prince and hands him the Millennium Puzzle, telling the pharaoh to not let this treasure fall into the wrong hands, as it could lead to breaking the seal to a terrible calamity. He also claims that Seto is not to be trusted, as he's Haishin's right hand man. And Simon Moran holds off Seto, giving the prince a chance to run. But Haishin shows up in the nick of time, and he manages to corner both the prince and Simon Moran, demanding the Millennium Puzzle. And Simon Moran now realizes that only one option remains, and that is for the pharaoh to defeat Haishin in a duel. And in the duel against Haishin, Haishin runs way too many powerful cards, making him impossible to defeat with the starter deck. And due to this, the pharaoh loses by a landslide. And as Haishin is about to rip the puzzle away from the pharaoh, Simon Moran grabs him and tells the pharaoh that the only way out of this situation is to shatter the Millennium Puzzle. The pharaoh obliges and shatters the Millennium Puzzle, ruining the plans of Haishin and saving the life of the pharaoh. But this did not come without a great cost. The Pharaoh wakes up inside the Millennium Puzzle and sees Simon Moran. And Simon is relieved to hear that the Millennium Puzzle and the Pharaoh are safe. Simon explains to the Pharaoh that his soul is now trapped inside the Millennium Puzzle, and he expresses his regrets and says that this was the only way to save the Pharaoh and the Puzzle, as this was the only option, as the power of darkness Hyson was seeking would lead to the destruction of the world. And now that the Pharaoh's soul is trapped, Simon tells the Pharaoh that they must wait for the person who is destined to fix the Millennium Puzzle, as that person and the Millennium Puzzle are the only way to return the Pharaoh back to his own world. And now with many years is spent, the pharaoh goes back to sleep in order to wait for that fateful day. Joy Wheeler calls out to a dozing off Yugi, and Yugi wakes up. And Yugi mentions that he had this weird rib to Joy, but Joy cuts him off as they have to attend the opening ceremony of the tournament. We cut to the announcer, who introduces us to the Yu-Gi-Oh World Tournament, which is being hosted by Kaibacorp to determine who is the best duelist in the world. And as Yugi and Joy watch from the sidelines, the tournament sponsor, Seto Kaiba, comes up to the stage to speak a few words including a declaration to win the tournament himself. And after the ceremony, Taya meets Yugi at the card shop, and she encourages Yugi to do his best, as his next opponent, it's Rex Raptor. Now that the whole premise of the game is set up, it's finally time to talk about the game mechanics. And before I really get into this game, I just realized that the venue that this game takes place in is the Tokyo Dome, where Konami was going to host nationals in Japan during the same year that this game was released, but eventually it ensued into a public disaster and a riot, which is pretty interesting to me, because I covered this in a previous video. The Yu-Gi-Oh! World Tournament is separated into two separate sections, the preliminary rounds and the finals rounds, with the preliminary rounds having four opponents that you must have beat in order to make it to the finals. And in the first battle of the preliminaries, you'll be dueling against Rex Raptor as the very first opponent you have to beat in order to advance through the story, and this is where the game really begins. 
I think that it's no secret that Forbidden Memories is a hard game. And right out of the gate, the game just shows how hard it can really be. As in my first duel against Rex, he had Fusion Summon a Flame Kerberos on his very first turn. And because of my lack of understanding of Forbidden Memories game mechanics at the time, I had lost to him as I couldn't figure out a way to beat a 2100 attack monster that was on the board. And because of this, I had to go and practice against Duel Master K in hopes of getting better cards. And outside of the game, there is a free duel screen where you can duel any opponent you've beaten. And one of those was Duel Master K. And for beginners, he's actually quite helpful, as since he has the same deck as you, he can also show you what fusions he can make, which you can use for your own deck. And while I'm at it, I might as well show the guys I was using to learn the game, as I was spending a long time figuring things out. As Forbidden Memories is far more complex and goes far more in-depth than any other game I've talked about so far. And one of the biggest factors this game presents is the fact that you can fusion summon whenever you want using the cards in your hand. And it's a prevalent staple of this game. In order to master and defeat Forbidden Memories, you'll need to get used to the fusion mechanic as this will be your best friend. And I'm going to be completely honest, it's absolutely necessary. And I'm definitely going to be mentioning this mechanic way more in this video. But the fusion mechanic was hard to get used to, as it was far different from the mechanics of the TCG, as figuring out which monsters can fuse can be a daunting task for beginners, which could definitely starve off any new players from this game. And the difficulty skill Rex alone requires players to master the fusion mechanic, as the best monsters in your starter deck pale in comparison to the best monsters that Rex has. And one of the best online guides I had used while learning this game was Taya Online, which was a fan site dedicated directly towards Forbidden Memories. And Taya Online has guides for all the opponents in the game, including their drop rates and even a fusion calculator, which is what I had been utilizing until I had gotten used to the fusion mechanic. And so here's the gist of how it works. When one monster fuses with another type, they'll make a new monster. So for example, if an aqua and dragon type monster fuse together, they'll make spike seed drop. And if a beast and a female fuse together, they'll make the 1900 attack Nekogal. And those are some of the most easiest examples I can think of from my head. And these fusions are mainly based on the monster's typing, where compatible types are able to fuse with each other. And as for Rex, He's pretty tame, especially if you master the fusion mechanic and know how this game works, as most of the monsters in his deck have the same attack threshold as the monsters in your deck. And so Rex is just there to show new players just how hard this game can really be. Right after beating Rex Raptor, the second round of the preliminary features Weevil Underwood as the opponent to face, and unlike Rex Raptor, Weevil actually has a full-on strategy with his deck, as his deck is based around insect monsters. Utilizing cards such as Laser Cannon Armor and Forest, Weevil has cards in his deck that can boost the attack power of his monsters, making them incredibly strong, and he's also got Juraigumo a 2200 attack monster which has no drawbacks compared to his TCG effect, which can be hard to out this early in the game. And Weevil has access to a lot of monsters in the 1500 attack or lower range as well, which the starting deck cannot face easily. And while I'm at it, I should also mention how decks are constructed in this game, to give you a better understanding. When you start a duel of Forbidden Memories, the opponent's deck is randomly constructed from a list of cards, with each card having a percentage chance of appearing in the deck. And the game will also give the most notable cards in their decks the highest chances of showing up, but will also shuffle around the cards with a similar theme to it. This gives a unique dueling experience, as each experience is tailored towards a player, and although it is a random experience, it's actually quite nice to know that each duel that is played in this game has deviation to a degree, as you could always replay the duel until you finally get your good match. And all of this combined makes dueling in this game a lot more breathtaking and enjoyable, as each element feels like it was handcrafted. Analogies aside, for me, I had easily beaten Weeble in my first playthrough due to the fusion mechanic helping me bring out a strong monster on the very first turn. And even though Weeble is an easy opponent, he is also a really hard opponent for new players. Although, Weevil is a clear example of showing power creep in this game, but this was only a taste of what was to come. My Valentine is the third opponent you'll have to face in the preliminary rounds, and her deck is based around the Harpy Ladies and other Winged Beast monsters. The main strategy surrounding her deck is to use Winged Beast monsters in conjunction with equipped spells to power them up, giving her monsters a boost. And I was going to use this character as a scapegoat to back up my claims about the difficulty spike of this game, which my chat had warned me about. 
but in my case, I had swept her easily, as a powerful fusion monster like Nekogao was enough to keep her at bay, since Mai had only used quest spells as their main strategy, and not actual fusion monsters, making this an easy fight, as winged beast monsters don't have a lot of compatibility for fusion summoning in this game. The best monster in her deck is Harpy's Pet Dragon, with 2000 attack, but that has a rare chance of showing up at all, as the chance of it showing up in a deck is only a 0.1% chance. And you know what? There's something I completely forgot to mention in this review, so I'm going to mention it right now. When you defeat an opponent in Forbidden Memories, they'll drop a card when you beat them, but the problem is that they only drop one card, just like the Game Boy games. And that card shop you saw earlier? Yeah, it serves no purpose other than just being a save point, meaning the only way to obtain cards in Forbidden Memories is by winning duels, and duels in this game are not fast, as they take a long time to beat. And to only get one card in a duel makes this game just as grindy as the Duel Monsters Game Boy games, if not even worse as the drop rates for good cards in this game is horrendous, and you'll find that the chances of getting a good card to drop are so low, especially considering the amount of time it takes to complete a duel in this game. Because to even beat the opponents at this stage in the game, you'll have to be somewhat knowledgeable about the game's mechanics, which is not easy to do, as the game proves that it is difficult to master. Bandit Keef is the final opponent of the preliminary rounds, and Bandit Keef's deck is an assortment of mainly fiend, machine, and zombie type monsters. With a lot of high attack monsters to boot, Bandit Keef is no joke in this game. Compared to the last three opponents that I had talked about, they pale in comparison, especially considering the difficulty that Bandit Keef has. And even with that, it's still only a preview of the difficulty to come in the future. One of the biggest challenges about Bandit Keef is that the attack threshold of every monster he summons is far greater than the ones you possess. And in my experience, when I had dueled Bandit Keef for the first time, he absolutely floored me, as I wasn't able to deal with an 1800 attack monster that he was able to summon on the first turn. Right after that, he managed to fusion summon a 2800 attack fusion monster known as a twin headed thunder dragon. And yes, I know what you're thinking, we'll definitely go over him later. But because of this, I absolutely got floored by him, as his monsters were far stronger than what I could make. Afterwards, I had to grind for a lot of cards in order to defeat Bandit Keef, as yes, he was that hard, and it was probably going to be a good time to do it anyways, since I was expecting it to get far worse after Bandit Keef. And after an hour of farming, I decided to duel him again, and had barely beaten him using the Crimson Sunbird that I had to fuse for. As that duel was hard, as he had gotten me low with his other monsters such as Mechanical Chaser, before I was finally able to make that Crimson Sunbird, effectively winning me the duel. And one more thing to point out, when you beat Bandit Keep, he refers to himself as a card professor, which was a gilded duelist that featured prominently in Yu-Gi-Oh! R. And although Bandit Keep was killed by Pegasus in the manga, he was still seen as the most well-known card professor, and was resurrected to have a rematch with Joey in the manga, which is something I had noticed when playing through Forbidden Memories for the first time, since I had barely remembered that Keef was one of the card professors in the Yu-Gi-Oh! R manga, so that was a nice throwback. And with all of that, the preliminaries are now cleared. After the last preliminary match, Joey meets up with Yugi and reminisces about how they've been doing in the tournament, promising each other to meet in the finals. And as they are talking, Yugi points out that Shadi is approaching them, and Shadi confronts Yugi, who claims that his Millennium item, the Millennium Key, is reacting to the Millennium Puzzle. And Shadi came here to discover the secrets of the Millennium items, and claims that all of the Millennium items are gathered in this very tournament. Yugi then tells Shadi about the presence of another guy just like him, that he's been dreaming about, as if he were locked inside of the puzzle. And Shadi tells Yugi that he has a doppelganger inside him, named Yami Yugi and he asks Yugi if he wants to meet his evil twin. Shadi explains that with the power of his Millennium Key, he can open Yugi's mind, which could probably lead Yugi to meet his other self. Yugi then sees what Shadi is saying, and agrees to go with Shadi's plan, touching the Millennium Key, and telling him to relax and open his mind. Inside the puzzle, Yugi confronts his other self, and expresses his excitement in meeting him for the first time. And Yugi takes a look inside of the pharaoh's mind and understands him. Because of this, Yugi decides that he wants to help, so he asks the pharaoh what he must do. And the pharaoh shows Yugi a card in his hand, before vanishing inside the puzzle. Yugi then wakes up and recalls what happened to Shadi, saying that he knows that the pharaoh was a prince that was trapped in the puzzle a long time ago. The pharaoh had asked Yugi for help to get back to his own world, but Yugi doesn't know what to do. And suddenly, Joey tells Yugi about the blank cards in his hand, which Yugi just notices as well. 
Yuki says that he doesn't know how to use these cards, but Shadi claims that it might have to do with the Millennium items. And before they can ponder any further, all the participants are called back for the finals of the tournament. The finals have begun, and for the first match of the finals, we're up against Shadi, a duel that was fated to be. Shadi plays a semi-water themed deck that uses cards like Spike, Seedra, Umi, and Steel Shell to give him an advantage in the duel. And although his cards are somewhat more random than the other duelists, his deck is mainly based around Umi. In my personal experience against Shadi, he had summoned Spike Seedra on his very first turn, but during this duel, I had learned about and used an incredibly important card in Forbidden Memories. This is a card that literally everyone knows is essential to beating Forbidden Memories, and it's really easy to make even with weak decks. And the notoriety and legacy of this card makes it one of the most iconic cards ever in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! And that card's name is the Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. Before I even went into Forbidden Memories, I literally knew that this was the main strategy of the game. The story surrounding this card and its widespread use in the speedrunning community has given this card a sort of meta status. As fusion summoning the Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon is easy to do, especially once you get used to the systems that this game has. So basically, how it works is that when a Thunder Monster fuses with a monster with 1600 or more attack, it makes the Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. And although it can't fuse with every monster that has 1600 or more attack, there are still a large number of monsters that can fuse to make this card. And if you don't have a monster with 1600 or more attack, you can still make this if you have another dragon in your hand, as any dragon monster can fuse with a huge number of monsters in this game to create that 1600 attack monster that can be placed on the board. For example, if a dragon type monster and an aqua type monster fused, it would make the 1600 attack spike Cedra, which can then fuse with a thunder type monster to make twin headed thunder dragon with 2800 attack. And the best thing is that you can perform multiple fusion summons in the same turn, effectively letting you summon this card as soon as you gather the materials for it. And with the sheer number of combinations that this card has in order to make it, and with how easy it is to obtain the materials to make the card in the first place, makes twin headed thunder dragon one of the best cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. After finally understanding how to make twin headed thunder dragon, I had used it to defeat Shoddy, effectively winning me the duel. And after defeating Shoddy, his Millennium Key and Millennium Scales get absorbed inside the blank cards that Yugi has in his possession, finally revealing the true purpose of what the Pharaoh wanted, which is for Yugi to collect all the Millennium items in the cards, which I'll have to do by winning in the tournament. The second match of the finals is against Bakura, who claims he is here because of the influence of the Millennium Ring. And all of a sudden, Bakura's personality and energy changes into his evil self. And before I go off and say anything, I want to talk about his design. Like what the hell happened here? Did the artist get it wrong? It just looks so off compared to his mega counterpart. I feel like Yami Bakura's design here is just a bootleg. I know it's a nitpick on my part, but that seriously does not sit well with me. Moving on, Bakura is a perfectly normal opponent with nothing wrong whatsoever, as all he does is set monsters in face down defense position. And when you attack those monsters face down, you're greeted by the Great Labyrinth Wall. And all of a sudden, the sudden realization hits you, and you realize that he's playing a defense deck, which is tailored towards setting high defense monsters in defense mode. But in my first duel against Bakura, he had two labyrinth walls on his side of the field, which I couldn't deal with normally. And since there were only two ways for me to get rid of labyrinth wall in the first place, I had to go through specific combos in order to get rid of his cards. Bakura also has 1900 attack monsters in his deck, like Gemini Elf which can spring out of nowhere and start attacking monsters you control while you're waiting for your pieces. Essentially, the main way for Bakura to win in this duel is to wait for a deck out while stalling with his monsters, which is how I lost to him in my first time against him, as I was unprepared to deal with high defense walls like Labyrinth Wall. As I was just not expecting it, since every opponent before like Shoddy was far easier to deal with. And due to this, the difficulty gap had jumped far higher than what I had anticipated, despite the fact that I had easily beaten Bakura in my second time against him, as he wasn't able to draw Labyrinth Wall by the time I was able to kill him. And yeah, it can happen, he can brick, and that was the thing that had led me to be able to beat him. And after the duel, Bakura's Millennium Ring gets sucked into the card, freeing Bakura from his curse. The World Tournament has progressed into the quarterfinals, with Pegasus being the opponent that you'll have to face. And Pegasus possesses the Millennium Eye, knowing what cards you'll have face down. It's also at this point that the game decides to stop fucking around with you. This is where it actually gets hard, 
Pegasus's deck is mostly composed of monsters that have over 2000 attack each, and when you compare the attack gap between your monsters and Pegasus's monsters, you'll begin to realize that this game was rigged from the start. The starter deck consists of monsters that barely have 1000 attack each, and for some reason, the drops for decent monsters with 1600 attack or above are incredibly difficult to get, as the drop chances for all these monsters are really low, and it would take even a lot more grinding to even get one of these monsters. Because of this, the power gap between the player and the opponent is so large that comparing the monsters in your deck compared to an NPC is like an ant getting squashed by a human, except this time you're the ant. The only way to even get monsters that compare to the power level of Pegasus's monsters is the fusion summon, with the most reliable one being Twin Headed Thunder Dragon, as the other fusion monsters like Necrogal or Flame Kerberos have a hard time dealing with some of Pegasus's monsters, like Bakuri Box or Parrot Dragon. And if you thought Twin Headed Thunder Dragon was unstoppable here, you'd be dead wrong, as Pegasus apparently has an assortment of spell cards literally capable of getting rid of any monster, such as Regeki that can wipe the whole board, or Bright Castle that can boost the monster's attack by 500. He's also got cards like Fake Trap, which could be used to bait attacks, and Harpy's Feta Duster to completely clear any trap cards that would get in the way. Pegasus will usually have 3 copies of Regeki and Harpy's Feta Duster in his deck, so strategies revolving around summoning monsters like Twin Headed Thunder Dragon might get destroyed very quickly. And finally to top things off, he has a chance to have Meteor Black Dragon in his deck, which is one of the most strongest monsters in this game, and something that is practically impossible to beat even for Twin Headed Thunder Dragon, as Meteor Black Dragon has 1500 attack on its own making it incredibly difficult to out. In my first duel against Pegasus, he summoned it against me, effectively winning him the duel within two turns, as I couldn't do anything about it. And I lost various other times to Pegasus as well, whether that would be by breaking, by him drawing Regeki, or just by him summoning another Meteor Black Dragon on me. And with all these elements merging together, Pegasus becomes the first hard opponent of Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. But Pegasus is beatable if the stars align, because you can fool the AI to not activate their magic cards in Forbidden Memories. So essentially what it boils down to, is that if you control a monster while they don't control one, the NPCs in this game will always try to summon a monster, even if they have a magic card in their hand that can turn the situation around. Using this knowledge, you can control the situation and eventually win the duel, provided that you don't let them control a monster. And this technique works if you're lucky enough to summon Twin Headed Thunder Dragon early in the duel, as the chances of Meteor Black Dragon appearing in his deck are low. Besides this, Pegasus shows off the base level difficulty that this game has, as we've touched only the tip of the iceberg. The semi-finals match is against Isis, who is this game's incarnation of a Shizu Estar from the manga. And unlike her personality from Duel Monsters, Isis's personality could only be described as fierce, as her only lines and gestures are aggressive. Isis's deck is mainly a water deck, with a high emphasis on the Umi field spell. A lot of her monsters possess really high attack or defense stats, making her monsters incredibly strong, especially if she manages to play Umi, which can boost the attack of all water monsters on the field by 500. But that's not all. Isis also has Swords of Revealing Light, which she can use to stall out a duel for 3 turns, and get the combo pieces she needs. And she's also got Spellbinding Circle, which is a card that can reduce the attack of all monsters you control by 500 each, making it a perfect combo with Swords of Revealing Light. Although Isis has a competent deck, she is not without weaknesses. One of the biggest faults of Isis is that every monster she plays uses the Neptune Guardian sign, which, in this game, is weak to the Pluto Guardian sign. And Twin Headed Thunder Dragon does possess the Pluto Guardian Star, making it be able to out any monster she uses. And not to mention that Umi can buff your monsters as well, making this duel somewhat easy, as being able to draw the right monsters can practically seal the fate of this duel, as most Pluto monsters can easily beat Isis. In my experience, Isis proved to be quite a challenge, but I managed to beat her on my first try, as all she could do in front of my Twin Headed Thunder Dragon was stall, which had given me enough time to accumulate 2 copies of Twin Headed Thunder Dragon and win the duel with only 2 cards left in my deck. And with that, we finally beat an all of the opponents in the finals. After defeating Isis, Yuki now has 6 out of the 7 Millennium items in his possession, with only one more to obtain, and Sero Kaiba confronts us as the last opponent of the World Tournament, becoming the very last obstacle in our way, as he reveals that he has the Millennium Rod, which is definitely far different from his manga counterpart, as we know that Merrick is the original holder of the Millennium Rod, but we've already come this far, so I'm not going to complain any further about continuity and the like. So let's get back on track and get the Millennium Rod back from Kaiba. 
Kaiba is the final opponent of the World Tournament, and he runs an assortment of cards related to the cards he used in the manga, such as Cross Card Virus. And Kaiba runs a huge amount of dragons, thunders, and other cards that utilize fusion summoning. As Kaiba makes use of these various monsters to make Mystical Sand, Flame Kerberos, and Twin Headed Thunder Dragon. Not to mention that he also has Blue Eyes White Dragon, which is hard to out, since it has over 3000 attack. And cards like Mountain benefit Blue Eyes, so using cards like that are out of the question. Kaiba also has a chance for Millennium Shield and Labyrinth Wall to get in his deck, helping him stall the duel until he draws his Blue Eyes White Dragon. So the main strategy I have is to hope to draw into Twin Headed Thunder Dragon and beat Kaiba before he summons Blue Eyes White Dragon, because as soon as that hits the field, it's game over. As in my playthrough, I lost to Kaiba multiple times, as I didn't draw into Twin Headed Thunder Dragon multiple times, as my deck was horribly inconsistent at the time. And since it was still early within the game's playthrough, I didn't have a lot of Thunder and Dragon monsters to utilize at this point as I had only managed to beat Kaiba once, because I got lucky, and that was it. While looking back at Kaiba's cards and stats, I couldn't help but notice that he has the Ultimate Dragon Ritual spell, which is quite interesting to me. It's similar to the Duel Monsters Game Boy series, where fusion in that game is performed only using 2 cards instead of 3. And because of this, every monster that has 3 fusion materials were turned into ritual monsters like the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. And just like the Game Boy games, ritual spells are just as useless in this game, as they require specific conditions to be fulfilled, with all the monsters required in the ritual summon to already be on the field. And I won't lie, it's probably cool seeing Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon getting summoned, but the chances of that are incredibly low, so if anyone has actually seen Kaiba summon Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, just let me know. That's actually pretty intriguing to me, and I would actually like to see that. And while Kaiba was hard, he definitely had his faults. It's just that for me, I haven't done much grinding yet, so defeating Kaiba with my partially completed deck was a daunting task for me. And with Kaiba beaten, we have finally beaten the World Tournament, and the Millennium Rod gets sucked into the last blank card. And with all 7 Millennium items finally in Yugi's possession, he can finally set out and do what he was supposed to do, which was to return the items to the Pharaoh. As the items are finally transported back into the puzzle, the pharaoh is finally able to go back into their own world. And Simon Moran, who was trapped inside of the puzzle, compliments Yugi for his bravery and even compares him to the pharaoh. As the Millennium items are being pulled against each other over time, the portal to their own world has opened, where Haishin has created his own expansive realm and has utilized a portion of the powers of darkness, with the 6 remaining Millennium items in his possession. Simon Moran then reveals that Haishin has stored the Millennium items in various temples to protect them, and that the Forbidden Ruins has the locations of each Millennium item, and he tells the Pharaoh to retrieve the Millennium items and finally seal them once and for all. And before they set out, Simon Moran tells the Pharaoh that he must depart, as he was killed just before the puzzle broke, leaving Simon Moran without a body to return to. And as the Pharaoh leaves, he leaves him these last words. The rest is up to you. May success be yours. The Pharaoh wakes up and returns back to ancient Egypt, only for him to realize that the kingdom is now in disarray, as Metropolis was destroyed. When the Pharaoh stumbles upon the old dueling grounds, Jono finds the Pharaoh and calls out to him, and Jono explains to us that the entire place had some massive changes since our disappearance, as the High Mages had destroyed the dueling grounds and the card shop that he and his friends used to go to, as they were now looking for the missing Pharaoh. And because of this, everyone has gone into hiding, and Jono alongside the card shop owner had moved their dueling grounds to a secret location that was nearby, which he takes us to. When we arrive at the dueling grounds, we meet Teana who is residing in the secret dueling grounds expressing her gratitude that the pharaoh was still alive. And just like in the previous dueling grounds, you can duel both Jono and Teana there in a casual setting, with them not being as hard to defeat as they are opponents that had appeared previously. Although if you lose to either, it will take you back to your last save, like with other campaign opponents. So be sure to save as there is a card shop nearby, otherwise you'll be taken back to Kaiba. After that grateful encounter, the pharaoh goes to the king's valley, where the forbidden ruins are located. Upon entering king's valley, the pharaoh is approached by a peculiar looking man named Sodden, who is telling the pharaoh to leave, until he realizes that he's talking to the pharaoh himself. Once Sodden realizes he's talking to the pharaoh, he reveals that although Haishin hasn't found these ruins yet, he has killed both of the pharaoh's parents. The pharaoh then brings up the forbidden tomb, which Sodden replies that he doesn't know about because there's so many tombs in the valley. 
and this leads us to leave King's Valley in order to find more information about the tomb, which evidently has us searching inside of the destroyed pharaoh's palace. As the pharaoh enters the palace, he gets spotted by one of Haishin's men, who tells him to get out, but we refuse, and this leads us to duel him. The Mage Soldier is one of the first opponents that we'll have to face in the Millennium World, and he is one of the easiest opponents to duel in this game, as his strongest monster is the 2200 attack Jiraigumo, and because of this, he's incredibly easy to beat, as summoning a monster that has over 2000 attack is more than enough to beat him, so I won't go through this duel too much, as the next opponents after Mage Soldier are just harder than him in general. And after beating the Mage Soldier, he admits to underestimating the Pharaoh, and leaves the room. The room apparently was Simon Moran's room before Haishin had attacked the place. And after a bit of rummaging, you discover an ancient papyrus, which is the map that leads to the Forbidden Ruins. After arriving at King's Valley with the map, Sadine guides you to the Forbidden Ruins after taking a look at the map. Both the Pharaoh and Sadin arrive at the Forbidden Ruins, with Sadin talking about the ancient sorcerers who hid the secrets of their magic within the royal tomb. In the room, there is a wall with both a drawing and a map. And when taking a look upon the map, Seto suddenly appears and comes into the room, and he says that this map is depicting the locations of the Millennium Items. Seto claims that he's been following the Pharaoh, as he wanted to know the location of the Forbidden Ruins for himself, as he suspected that Hai Shin already knew about this place, and had used this to find the other Millennium Items that were in the temples. Seto also says that Hai Shin is planning to gather all the Millennium Items to rule the world one day. Sadin questions Seto's motives, as he is Hai Shin's right hand man. But Seto is ambiguous about this, as Seto states that he's merely interested in the Pharaoh's capabilities, and wants to see if the Pharaoh can beat the High Mages. And after that, Seto bids his farewell and leaves urgently, and Sadin advises you to proceed with caution, as Seto might have an ulterior motive. And with that, the hunt for the Millennium Items begins. When doing this retrospective on Forbidden Memories, there's this one thing I've been hesitant to talk about in this overview, and that's the grind. I had barely spoken about it in the previous portions of my review, and I figure if there's any part where I can fit this in, it's right here. It's no secret that Forbidden Memories is an exceptionally difficult game, with game balance being awfully skewed in the favor of the opponent, as the difficulty scale in this game spikes exponentially from one opponent to the next. And the biggest thing to come out of this game is that the power of your deck will quickly be outmatched in this game, as the pace you get cards in this game is way too low for the game to be considered beatable without a grind. And furthermore, the game has a password system similar to Doom Monsters 2, but that has its limits. So basically, each card in this game has a cost, and each of these cards must be bought with star chips. But the cost for most of these cards are high, or outright unreachable, as the amount of star chips you can get from a duel range from 1 to 5. And because of this, people usually tend to only get low-cost cards from the password system, like weak thunder monsters, as those cards still have a use, even if they have a low attack. But the main point I'm getting here is that in order to beat Forbidden Memories, you have to partake in the grind. And usually people do this just as they reach the mages. But for me personally, this is where I also did my grinding. Like I said earlier, Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon is an incredibly good monster in Forbidden Memories. Since its stats are relatively good, it's compatible with a lot of equipped spells, and it's relatively easy to make. And one of the biggest elements to making your deck better in Forbidden Memories is to make your deck more consistent. And the best way to do that is by adding dragons and thunders into the deck, so that you can easily make the twin-headed thunder dragon. So finding ways to effectively get more dragon type and thunder type monsters are essential to the grind. In addition to that, you'll need equipped spells that are compatible with twin-headed thunder dragon. And even though twin-headed thunder dragon has good stats, there will be a point in this game where this card will get power crept out and get easily beaten by the opponent's monsters. For example, there's already been some opponents that have had monsters that could beat when had a thunder dragon like pegasus with his 3500 attack meteor black dragon and the main goal here is to obtain enough cards so that twin headed thunder dragon can hold its own against other cards like meteor black dragon as i know for a fact that this is not the last time we'll be seeing that card and thankfully this game is very popular and even has its own dedicated speedrunning community and due to this there are various guides and strategies based around farming the opponents in this game and i had used one of these speedrunning guides created by a well-known speedrunner known as GFC, 
who dissects the game using his knowledge. And namely his speedrunning guide states exactly what opponents we should farm to get the most efficient results. And our goal personally was to get more dragons and also get an equip spell at the same time. So I had decided to farm for Isis, who drops a lot of dragon monsters and has a low chance of dropping dragon treasure. But even though I was dead set on getting all of these cards, little did I know just how rough this grind would be. I think now would be a good time to explain how the card drops work in Forbidden Memories. Based on how you perform in a duel, you'll get a rating, and that rating influences what cards drop in this game, ranking from S rank to D rank. And alongside that rating, you'll be given a technical and a power rating associated with the rank that you are just given. A power rating is the most common to achieve, with it just being achieved easily by putting your opponent's life points to zero. And a technical rating is more hard to achieve, as it's achieved only through special conditions, like Deckout or Exodia. And there are three separate card pools associated with the card drops, separated as SPOW, STEC, and B2F. With the B2F drops being the easiest to obtain, as it doesn't need many special conditions to achieve, but they also generally have the worst card drops out of the three. The SPOW card drops are more difficult to achieve, as it requires you to finish off your opponent quickly while having a deck of 28 or more cards, with the cards being dropped virtually being good. And STEC is the hardest out of the three, but it also gives the best cards out of the three due to the various conditions needed to achieve this. And you'll need to jump through a lot of hoops to get a single STEC card, which I'll cover later down the line in this video. And the last thing I'd like to cover is that ATEC and APOW also share the same card drops as STEC and SPOW respectively. And while I did talk about the importance of SPOW and STEC cards, right now they aren't as important as they are later. And the cards we're looking for from Isis reside in the B2F card pool of drops, which are easy to achieve. And all you have to do is make sure that your deck has 27 or less cards, which can be easily achieved through fusion summoning and hand filtering. And while Isis's SPOW and STEC cards might be decent, cards like our Dragon Treasure only drop in our B2F card pool and not the SPOW card pool. And let me tell you right now, even with all this planning, the drop chances for the cards are incredibly low, as the chances of Isis even dropping a Dragon Treasure in the first place is a little bit above 1.5%. And although Isis drops a lot of dragons, as it's almost a 20% chance of even getting one in the first place, the drop chance is still low, considering the amount of duels you have to do in order to get a decent amount. And you also have to win the duels to even get a card. And while I do know that Isis is easy to farm, as Isis usually favors Neptune type monsters, and Twin Headed Thunder Dragon is a Pluto. There are games you'll brick, which will cause you to lose. But considering my experience, I think I had spent around 7 hours across multiple streams farming Isis before I had decided to switch up my farming strategy. And within those 7 hours of farming Isis, I did get a fair share of dragons, and I even got Umi from her, but I didn't get a single dragon treasure from her. Not a single one. And this was ultimately stressful, as I had needed an equipped spell that was compatible with Twin Headed Thunder Dragon in order to progress in this game. And as you all know, 7 hours is a long time. And there was a good card that Isis had that I forgot to mention, and that was Widespread Ruin. And while I didn't get Dragon Treasure from Isis, I did manage to get two copies of Widespread Ruin from her. And Widespread Ruin is a card that destroys any monster that attacks, which can be used to help solidify our formation. But what's good about this trap card is that it unlocks the potential for a new type of farm, one where I'll have even higher chances than before to get an equip spell, which many people call Pegasus s -tag. The STEC rating is one of the hardest ratings to achieve consistently in Forbidden Memories. As I mentioned earlier, these are far harder to obtain than the usual POW rating. To get a technical win in Forbidden Memories, you'll have to achieve a special condition while doing, whether that be via Exodia, Deckout, or following a specific set of conditions. The first STEC method I'll cover is a Deckout, since that one is easier to understand. And the best way to do this to my knowledge is to place monsters face down for the first two turns, so that the AI is urged to fusion summon, effectively making them have less cards in their deck from you. But the problem with the deck out method is that you will need to have monsters that can make a field presence without needing to use fusion summons. Otherwise, you'll get overpowered quickly, as Pegasus generally has better monsters than you which seems practically impossible to do if you're in the early stages of the grind. But there is another way to achieve an A-Tech or even an S-Tech win without relying on Deckout or Exodia, as you can perform an S-Tech or even an A-Tech win by performing specific conditions within a duel, which is what I had been doing. This is where the trap cards you've obtained come in handy, as this is where they play a major role within the farming of S-Tech. Depending on the amount of trap cards that you have in your deck, 
the conditions of achieving s tech are slightly different. For the hardest out of the three, it requires a player to activate one trap card, play one magic card, play one equip card, play at least one monster face down, attack four times and be successful, have less than 7,000 life points, have less than three cards in your deck, and perform 15 fusion summons in the same duel. And this is the most common method out of the three, as it requires a player to only have one trap card to perform successfully. But as you can already tell, Aztec is far more intrusive than any other farming method in the game. And that's due to the amount of actions a player will have to perform in a duel. And keeping track of all of that can be a daunting task even for the most patient of players. And thankfully, there are ways to make the Aztec grind a little bit easier, as if you have 5 or more trap cards that you can use, you can take advantage of the other two conditions which are still hard to achieve, but far easier than the first option. While for both, you'll still have 3 or less cards in your deck, and have less than 7000 life points. The rest of the conditions are partially changed, as you won't need to do as many tedious tasks in a duel, like 15 fusion summons. Rather, it's more like an optional branch of path that you can choose to take within a duel which you can adjust accordingly to your preferred method of farming. And this gives a player an option to farm more freely within a duel. If that didn't make sense to you, here's the TLDR. The best way to Aztec is to activate 5 or more trap cards within a duel, and following a few conditions, like activating a magic card and equip spell within a duel, while waiting until your opponent has 3 cards left in their deck, before you decide to ultimately win the duel. As you can already tell, Aztec duels take forever to complete, as it can take virtually between 10-15 to 15 minutes per duel, or even longer to complete one duel. And that's only for one card. For my Aztec grinding, I had chosen Pegasus, as Pegasus had 3 equipped spells that could drop in his card pool. Those being Shine Palace, Dragon Treasure, and the best one, Megamorph which are all really good cards for dealing with the opponents in the late game. This is why I invested so heavily into doing S-Tech duels against Pegasus, because I really needed that equip spell, and going 7 hours in the game without one really does a number on you, as going to the rest of this game was going to be hell, and I knew that, but I will tell you right now, I think it went a total of 7 or 8 hours dueling S-Tech Pegasus, not getting a single equip spell from him across multiple streams in the week. It was the same monotonous process, get on, play a long 50 minute duel, where I stall, force activate traps and wait until I almost decked out, over and over and over and over again. And to take the mental implications of this, Pegasus was still just as hard as you might take him to be, as even the slightest of mistakes can tilt the balance in his favor. And remember, Pegasus has 3 Regeki and Harpy's Feather Dusters in his deck, and while he can't activate them while you control a field presence, the instant you forget and leave him with a monster on his field, he will use them, which will ultimately reset the progress on this duel, unless you are able to come back from it quickly, which is very hard to do against Pegasus. I think I've made this mistake so many times, where I think I'm going fine with Aztec farming, then I suddenly start daydreaming and pass my turn, which has made me lose a lot of duels against Pegasus overall. Not to mention, he also has Meteor Black Dragon. If that thing shows up and it cannot be dealt with easily, just surrender, as you cannot S-Tech against something like that. This repetitive process of having to duel in such a specific way is so unfun and monotonous, as it makes me question my intentions for even playing this game in the first place. When I had started Forbidden Memories, I knew that the grind was rough as I've heard stories about people taking 200 duels for Meteor Black Dragon. But now that I'm finally experiencing it for myself, I'd like to take a second to just say, holy shit, this game is fucking ridiculous. No sane man should ever take it upon himself to play this game. The worst part about this is that I had won against Pegasus almost 50 times, and I still didn't get any equipped from him. He has almost an 8% chance to even drop one. How the fuck did I not even get one? This was getting way beyond ridiculous at this point. I can't even find words to describe how I'm feeling right now. This game was literally sucking my very soul away from me, eating away from me for each failed card drop. And this wouldn't be that bad, but when you spend 15 minutes on a duel just to get a card that you don't want, it gets infuriating. And after about 17 hours worth of grinding, over and over in a monotonous fashion, I was finally able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. There it is, let's win! Uh, uh, nope, no luck. Whatsoever. Wait, what did I just... Fuck, now I have to wait a turn. <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah, no, now I have to wait a turn. Fuck. I have to, I have to summon a female unit with an equipment with the Eclipse spell. I fucking fucked up that. <laughs> I was like, oh, I put the Eclipse spell on. I was like, no, I'm not paying attention, man. There it is. Let's go. One, two, and let's win. <laughs> what? 
A moment of truth. Will we get it or be another fluke? It's a 50th game after all, maybe they might be generous. Bring it trigger! That's a card! Let's go! That's it! Yes! Yes, that's it! Let's go! Holy shit! There it is! Dragon Treasure! We can finally end it! Let's go! Yes! 17 hours wasted on this fucking game! Fuck this! <laughs> On my 50th duel against Dueling Pegasus, I had finally gotten my first equipped spell, and it was a Dragon Treasure. And while it wasn't the best one, it was still a card I needed nonetheless. At this point, I had decided to stop grinding, as I spent 17 hours grinding for one card, as any more, and I probably would have gone crazy. But with this one equipped spell I finally grinded for, and having more dragons and dungeons to work with, I can finally say that I am ready to fight the mages. The mages are a political group hell-bent on world domination, and are also the antagonists of Forbidden Memories. After Haishin's invasion of the royal palace, he gave each of the Millennium items to the high mages to guard them at various temples across the land, and the main goal right now is to beat each one of them individually and reclaim the Millennium items. And before I cover each temple individually, the themes between each mage battle are similar to one another, as each temple has a low mage and a high mage guarding the Millennium items. And in order to get the items, you have to be both mages in a row without losing. The game also introduces a game mechanic, where it automatically places a field spell at the start of the duel, which is based on the mage you are currently dueling, giving the mages an inherent advantage. Since their deck is mainly constructed around the field power bonus, which in turn makes the duels against the mages unfair. Since you'll either have to build a deck based around the field spell, or hope that you get lucky. And in Forbidden Memories, you can fight the mages in any order, so I'll be going over the ocean mages first. The Ocean Mages are the easiest to beat out of the 5 mages, and that's only because of one thing. The field spell placed in this duel is Umi, which Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon directly benefits off of, so a well-placed Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon can win you the duel. But if you don't have the materials to make Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon, well you're screwed, as High Mage Sakematon has high attack water monsters in his deck, and they can all be summoned easily using Fusion. And he's also got powerful magic cards like Rikeki in his deck. So he's just as hard to deal with just like with Pegasus and Kaiba. And after beating High Mage Sakematon, you'll get the Millennium Necklace. And now that we have two Millennium items in our possession, it is now time to go to the other shrines and get the other items. And the next shrine I had decided to go to was the Forest Shrine, which is guarded by the Low Forest Mage and High Mage Anubiasis. As you can already tell, there is also a field spell here, that being the Forest Field Spell. And unlike the last duel, where Umi made Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon stronger, this is not the same case with Forest, as Forest doesn't buff Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon, giving other monsters a chance to defeat it. And cards like Grape Moth and Javelin Beetle, which each had originally 2600 or less attack, each now have attack values that can naturally beat Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon, due to the Forest Field Power Bonus, and not to mention the huge variety of equipped spells that Anuspius has in his deck like Insect Armor with Laser Cannon, which can also make his monsters stronger. And if that was it, I would be lying, because he also has perfectly ultimate Grape Moth to put salt in the wound, which has similar stats to Meteor Black Dragon, so it's hard to out. So my best advice for anyone doing duels against the mages is that if you have a field spell like Umi in your deck, or quote spells, you have to use them especially the field spells, while the mages also run field spells in their deck. On the off chance they don't, it can allow for you to steal the win, as you need to secure the safety of your twin-headed thunder dragon so that you can set up countermeasures against perfectly ultimate great moth. And the only way to do that is to set up a field spell the turn before. And if you can manage to do that, and keep Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon alive before Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth is summoned, you should be able to win this duel. And even though I beat this duel in my first try, I had barely beaten it in my first try, only because I had gotten lucky with 1000 life points left to my name. And I will say that even though the Forest Mages were hard, I was lucky in my duels against them, and it was a difficult duel overall. After defeating High Mage Anubius, you'll get the Millennium Key, and when you return back to the dueling grounds, you'll be greeted by Jono, who comes to inform you that Seto and his mages had kidnapped Teyana, and so because of this, the Pharaoh and Jono set out to save Teyana by going to the Ancient Shrine, and inside of the shrine, they are blocked by a peculiar looking man, 
known as the Labyrinth Mage, who is blocking their way. And because of this, the Labyrinth Mage challenges you to a duel. And while I could talk about this duel, the Labyrinth Mage is easy to duel against, as the only threatening monster in his deck is Gate Guardian. But in my case, he didn't even draw it, so I don't even know what to say about this duel, as he was incredibly easy to defeat. After beating Labyrinth Mage, the players will have to go through a quick maze, where the player will have to go right or left until they reach the destination. And to save some time, here's the code for those that are actually interested. After going through the maze, you'll reach the end of the shrine, where Haishin and Seto have taken Teyana hostage, and Haishin is shocked to learn that the Pharaoh is still alive, and orders Seto to take care of him as he has more urgent matters to attend to. And Seto praises the Pharaoh for beating the labyrinth that was set up by him, and he releases Teyana, stating that he only wanted the duel, as Seto finds the joy in the battle. While I couldn't say a lot about the mage's difficulty, and I know I've said this a lot already in the review, but this is when the game kicks it into high gear, even when I've already talked about the various difficulty spikes that Forbidden Memories actually has. Because honestly, I think this is the point when the game becomes unfair, as every deck before this point all had a great weakness to them, whether that be through within bad monsters or bad equip spells, as Seto's only bad card is an unusable ritual spell and mostly every other card in his deck goes above the 2500 attack threshold. And like I've said earlier, the only way to defeat monsters in this threshold is through fusion. And while I'm talking about Seto Second's cards, I wanted to mention that he does have the Dark Magician, which absolutely makes zero sense whatsoever, since it's Kaiba. But considering what game I'm playing right now, I'm willing to let this pass for now. And just like the other duels I talked about, to defeat Seto Second, you'll have to set up a monster that has over 3000 attack on the board, which means to either set up an equip spell or a field spell on the board. As without them, Kaiba's Metal Zoa or Blue Eyes White Dragon will do the job. And while looking at Kaiba's deck, he apparently has Gate Guardian as well, which thankfully didn't show up in my duel against him. But I will say, I did get down to 500 life points, because I didn't even draw the monsters necessary to fuse for Twin Handed Thunder Dragon in the first place, until very late in the game. And one thing I would like to mention though, is that this encounter with Zeto Second won't happen unless you beat all of the mages, since going to the Ancient Shrine in this case would start the gauntlet as this encounter only shows up after you beat the two mages, and disappears after you defeat them all, making this entirely optional. But I brought it up anyways. But how long would it be before the Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon strategy was no longer viable? As I know our time is almost up, and after defeating Priest Seto, he applauds your ability and leaves you alone without Haishin noticing. Alright, so before we go into the final portion of this game, let's go over the last of the mages, since we still have a few more millennium items to gather. And the third shrine we have to go through is the mountain shrine, which is guarded by the low mountain mage and high mage Atenza. And while the low mountain mage isn't much to talk about, as the deck mainly contains winged beasts that can easily be beaten, high mage Atenza's deck however is not to be messed with, as he was difficult to beat. And as you can already tell, the field spell is mountain, which does boost twin headed thunder dragon's attack but it also boosts the attack of all the dragons that are in High Mage Atenza's deck, with one of them being the Black Skull Dragon, which inherently has a higher attack power than the Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. And because of that, I had lost badly on my first run against him, as he was able to beat me with Black Skull Dragon before I drew my one copy of Dragon Treasure to turn the duel around. And he's also got cards like Shadow Spell or Dragon Treasure, which can also turn the tide of the duel. And while High Mage Atenza was hard, he can break, which is how I have won against him on my second run, getting me the Millennium Ring. And the next run we have to go to is the Desert Temple, where the low Desert Mage and High Mage Martis reside with the Millennium Scales, where the default field spell for that duel is Wasteland, giving power to dinosaur and rock monsters. And while in this game there aren't a lot of good dinosaur or rock type monsters, there are still a few that cause a bit of a threat, but honestly they aren't good without that field power bonus. But I can tell you while the low mage wasn't a threat, High Mage Martis was, and that was because of this. Man, I think, whatever, got the drip, and they, oh, they think I'd be dealing with a fucking millennium wall, <laughs> think, out of all the fucking things I'd be dealing with a fuck, wait a minute, this is it, we finally found the out to millennium wall, let's go, <laughs> let's go.
Man, your money wall ain't gonna do shit against this. Should have fucking run back to life. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, fuck. No. No, no. I fucking did. <laughs> no. No, no. Whoop, uh, that's rough. The one chance I had. Fucking ruined. I knew you would fuck it up indeed. <laughs>
but it's still mainly the only choice that we have to fight monsters of this caliber, as most of the monsters we have are fundamentally weaker than any monster they'll throw at us. And some tactics, like defense mode manipulation, doesn't work anymore, as they always leave their strongest monsters in attack mode no matter what. Both Sebek and Neku start with the Yami Field spell on the field, giving all Fiend and Spellcasters a 500 attack bonus. And Sebek runs a deck based around Zoa and Metal Zoa, with Zoa being able to gain 500 attack from the field spell, giving Sebek two 3000 attack monsters that he runs at 3 copies each. Not to mention that he's also got Acid Trap Hole, so any unboosted Twin Headed Thunder Dragons will get killed instantly. And finally, Sebek has Shadow Spell, just to reduce the attack of monsters you control by 500. And Neku, on the other hand, is just as hard, if not even harder, as he has 5 monsters that can naturally beat Twin Headed Thunder Dragon with Yami up, such as the Dark Magician. And he's also got replacement field spells for his Yami, to ensure that he'll always activate Yami if you try to replace the field spell with something else. And just like Isis, he's also got Swords of Revealing Light to stall the duel for 3 turns, and Harpy's Feather Duster to wipe any spells and traps on the board. And I'll tell you something, I've lost to these two a lot, and I've definitely had to fight them over and over again each time I would have to redo the gauntlet, as I would keep losing to the rest of the opponents that were in the gauntlet. Before I talk about the next opponent in the gauntlet, I realized that I'll have to cut in and talk about the second rhyme portion during some point in this video. So I'll be doing it now, so I don't have to talk about it a lot later in the video. And so as you've already heard, this is a gauntlet, a series of battles where you'll have to beat everyone in a duel without losing, otherwise you'll get sent back to the beginning. And as for me, I luckily managed to get to the fourth opponent before I eventually lost to their overwhelming power. And that loss gave me the realization and shock I had needed in order to go back into full grind mode, as my current deck was far too unoptimized, and one equipped spell was not enough to fight what I just saw. And so, my eyes were locked on the Meteor Black Dragon, the best monster that you can get in Forbidden Memories. And so I decided to go in and just S-Pow Metal Mage over and over again, which I spent a very long time on. And while I did get some good cards like Dark Magician and Guide of Fierce Knight from him, I did not get Meteor, even after 60 duels. And so the next best thing I thought of doing was to get an equipped spell. And there was only one place I knew of, which I had dreaded thinking of doing again, which was Aztec Pegasus. Only because he has the highest drop rate for equipped spells out of any duelist. And I've already said why I hated this grind, as it forces you to fulfill specific conditions and leave your opponent alive for the whole duel, making each of those duels last roughly 15 minutes each. But I actually got lucky this time around with Pegasus, as in my first duel after my failed attempts of farming Meteor Black Dragon. I got a Bright Castle. And with that, I had now two equip spells that were compatible with Twin Headed Thunder Dragon. And I also used the password system to obtain Dragon and Thunder monsters that can allow me to make Twin Headed Thunder Dragon with only two monsters, rather than three, hopefully making my deck more consistent and stronger. And I decided to remove every monster that wasn't a Dragon or a Thunder monster. As at this point, I had a lot of each now, and I didn't have to rely on a middleman type like Aqua to make a 1600 or higher attack Dragon monster. And with all of that, I have a deck filled with dragons, thunders, high attack monsters, 2 equipped spells, and 3 widespread ruin, and I'm hoping that this is enough to get me through the gauntlet. After beating Sebek and Neku, Haishin stands in your way as the third opponent of the gauntlet, and he is no fucking joke, as Haishin still has a Yami field spell on his side of the field, just like the last two opponents of this game, even though Haishin only has two monsters that can benefit off it. But fuck that, Haishin has a serious amount of monsters that have over 3000 attack each, which is far more than any other opponent that we have faced so far in this game, as he's got Gate Guardian, Meteor Black Dragon, Black Skull Dragon, Blue Eyes White Dragon, Metal Zoa, and more. And he's got almost every single good spell or trap card that you can think of, such as Regeki, Widespread Ruin, Swords of Revealing Light, and even Megamorph. With Widespread Ruin and Megamorph being extremely serious threats in his deck, he will most likely always have a Gate Guardian or Meteor Black Dragon in his hand to help reinforce those cards. Even if not, he will probably have another powerful monster like Black Skull Dragon, as he's barely got any weak monsters. And I don't even know how I got past him the first time, as every single other time I had dueled him, I lost. And even my best setup, which is the Twin Headed Thunder Dragon being equipped with Dragon Treasure which can still be easily beaten by Gate Guardian. And I will say that this is probably the point where many people's childhoods 
have ended. As this is just way too hard for most people if you don't get lucky. As even with the best cards, he'll still have a way to defeat you. And don't even think that Umi will help you in this duel. While it can get Twin Headed Thunder Dragon 3800, which is enough to be Gate Guardian, Haishin has Megamorph, which boosts the monster by 1000 attack points. And if that card gets played, just say your prayers as the duel is practically over. After losing to the Gauntlet and Heishin so many times, I had decided to go on another grind, as what I had currently wasn't enough to beat him, as I had kept losing to Heishin over and over and over and over again, as he's the hardest opponent in this game so far. And it shows, just due to how unfair it is. And I don't even remember how many times I had lost to him alone, as he was the main factor that kept me from progressing in this game. And because of this, I decided that I needed some better cards, and so I had decided to get more equipped spells, meaning I would have to go back into Aztec Pegasus, which was a strategy where you stall a duel for 15 minutes, get a useless card, and repeat, over and over and over again. And at this point, I was going insane. I really, really, really did not like grinding in this game, as usually I would be okay with it if I got something of value, but in this game you get absolutely nothing, as only one card drops. So, during my 4th hour of farming Aztec Pegasus again for another equip spell, one of my friends, Josh Taco, hopped into the stream who is one of my longtime friends that I met in DMVR. And as I was explaining forbidden memories in the Aztec grind to him in the first game that he was in with me, this happened. Yeah, it's been five years by the way, just so you know, season zero videos. But uh... Season zero, five years and that's crazy. Joss, what's up my dude? Welcome. Yeah, it's just chilling. Yeah. I'm chilling a jam in the gym, you know, so... Gonna be hiding for a sec. Yeah. You going to sleep now, Josh? Wait, Josh um, in a little bit. Alright. Yeah, no. How's this game been going? I, I got the... Yeah, I'm still grinding. Yeah, no, so apparently the last gauntlet of this game is, uh... Yeah, 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 it's not good. It's it, it's not good. I thought I was set. Like, like I was grinding for a bit. I fucking went in. I got fucking decimated. That's how bad it was. So, yeah. And this game, still not as easy, still not, yeah no, still not easy, it's actually just hard as fuck. You just have to accept that. You got any more cook spells? <laughs> yeah. Oh dude, yeah, I got two, I got two cook spells actually, Josh. Dude, nice. Yeah, I know, fucking great. I got a whole two cook spells, are decks 40 cards in this? Yeah, 40 cards. So, yeah. Yeah, alright, so yeah, I just beat a duel. It took 10 minutes to do. 10 minutes to do? Let's see what I got. Josh, you, your luck! Your luck did it! I got Mega Morph! Let's go! Josh, no, your no, luck no, did no, it! No. I got Mega Morph! Let's go! You beat! That was, that was you. That was all you. That was all you. <laughs> that was all you. That's a third equip spell. That's a third equip spell. Sick! Sick! <laughs> Josh, you're the best. You know what? You're the best. Uh oh, you're fucking late. You're a fucking god to me now. Hey, <laughs> let's go. After Josh joined my stream, for some reason the luck of the gods were on my side, and they dropped me Megamorph, the best equipped spell in the game, only because it can equip to any monster in the game and give them a 1000 attack boost on top of that. Was it a coincidence? God. Who knows, this game has a fuck sense of humor, but I did believe that with Megamorph, we might actually be prepared to take on Haishin, and so I went back into the gauntlet with Josh the whole way. While on my way back to Haishin, I had shown Josh the ins and outs of Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, and even something cool that nobody cares about in this game, one of those being the 3D battle system. In Forbidden Memories, every monster has a 3D model, with multiple attack animations for each one, and they look really polished and detailed especially when compared to your average 3D model. But as you can already tell, who cares? Sure, I can commend the work put into every 3D model, and sure, I can say that they look good, but if I have to press another button to start the 3D model sequence, then something went wrong. And thank god 3D battles are optional, otherwise this game would take far longer to beat. As I can say one thing for sure, this game is unforgiving enough for me to not want to do 3D battles, as they just take a long time overall. However, I do like them, and I cannot deny that they definitely look good. Moving on, we finally made it to Haishin again, only to get decimated by his multiple Meteor Black Dragons and Regeki. And obviously we went back in, 
going through Sebek and Neku again. But this time when I had fought Haishin, I opened Golden, with buff away to make Twin Headed Thunder Dragon and having both Megamorph and Umi in hand, making my Twin Headed Thunder Dragon have a rare 4300 attack, which evidently won me the duel, as 4300 attack was just enough for me to win the duel. And with all that farce over, it's time for the fourth opponent in the final act of Forbidden Memories. After losing to the Pharaoh, Haishin can't believe that he lost to him, as Seto takes away the Millennium Rod from Haishin, and both Seto and the Pharaoh head for the Forbidden Ruins. Upon arriving at the Forbidden Ruins, Seto tells the Pharaoh that he's gonna end this farce once and for all, and finally reclaim the items for himself, as this was pre Seto's true motive, as he intended on getting his hands on all the items all along, which is why he helped the Pharaoh in the first place, as he finally saw the opportunity which he needed to gather all the items together, saving Seto the trouble of doing it himself, as he tells the Pharaoh that he was nothing more more than a pawn in his designs. Seto then reveals the true nature of the Forbidden Ruins, revealing a hidden chamber below the ruins. As Seto says the Millennium Items are the keys to unlocking the powers of darkness, as the Dark Lord had once given supreme power to the ancient kings and sorcerers, and Seto aimed to resurrect them to these very chambers and gain the supreme power to rule over everyone. And with this, Seto challenges you to a duel that will determine the very fate of the world. Hand is bad. Uh, <laughs> oh no. How should I start this? Stun pass, uh, trap? Trap and pass? I don't know. Uh, like, oh, how strong is he gonna come? I need, a, I need a hard filter these out, I think. Let's hard filter these out and just hope for a quote spell. What is it? Ah, oh, yeah, of course. What was I? What was I thinking? Of course, it was gonna be that. Of course, of course. I feel like widespread ruin would have been a better first turn. Yeah, you're right. It would have been. And now he has. You're right, Josh. What was I thinking? Uh, <laughs> you're right, Josh. Uh-oh, oh, there's nothing you can do now. That's just it. Not, not even freaking Megamorph can save you. <laughs> Who made this game? Who I want to have a talk with them. I want to have a talk. Like his normal summon the freaking Blue Eyes ultimate is kicking your eyes. <laughs> I'm never gonna beat this game. I'm never, I'm never gonna beat this game, Josh. I'm never gonna beat this game. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm never gonna beat this game. I'm He's just a normal son. What, what, what does he need the goddamn ancient tomb for? He's just carrying around a Glock. <laughs> He's carrying around a Glock. And so, with that devastating loss, we are back to square one. As Josh had told me that he was going to have to leave after that run, as it was really late that night. So, I guess it's over. There's absolutely no way I'll beat Forbidden Memories now. Just like most of the other YouTubers that have covered this game, I thought that it would happen this run, as I was really lucky during this run. But it seems my luck has run out. But before Josh had left, I wanted to show him my grinding process, and show him just what the Forbidden Memories grinding experience is really like. And so, we went through a quick low metal mage game, the one that draws Meteor Black Dragon, and I wanted to show him just one more game of grinding, as I wanted to show Josh the effort it takes to get one card in this game, before we called it quits for the night. Anger <laughs> Imas 
将軍分かっているはずだ今遊戯が勝てる可能性はレッドアイズにしかねえってでもでもレッドアイズ使っても負けちゃったらカードはきっと取られちゃうそしたら僕は昔の僕に逆戻りだそれでいいのそれが君の夢君のなりたかったデュエリストなの貴様はもう終わりだユーギーもはや何の手立ても残っていない俺は諦めないぜデュエリストの強さは勝利の可能性を信じて最後まで戦い続ける勇気があるかどうかで決まる青木龍は勝利をもたらすしかし赤木龍がもたらすものは勝利にあらず可能性なりただし戦う勇気があるものだけに。憧れてるだけじゃ手に入らねえ自分で掴むもんだ勝利にあらず可能性なりそんな可能性などないレッドアイズだろうと3体のブルーアイズにかなうはずが融合これがレッドアイズの可能性だまさかそんなカードすげえもしかしてあれがオブシェッんまい very first game of showing Josh the grinding experience of Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, Meteor Black Dragon drops, just like how Megamorph dropped earlier in the stream. And I want to stress just how rare of a drop chance it was. It was so rare that I jokingly said that Meteor Black Dragon was going to drop during this process. And I didn't realize that it was actually going to drop. Even people in my chat were saying that Meteor was going to drop. And guess what? They were right, as it came at the perfect time. At this point, this can't be a coincidence. Like, damn, two good drops in a row? Like, how lucky can we get? And with all of this luck behind us, me and Josh had decided that we should run the gauntlet again, as I had felt that this was definitely the run, as the both of us entered the gauntlet for the final time. Seto Third is the fourth opponent in the gauntlet, and based on what you've seen earlier, he's one of the hardest duels to duel in this game, as he has some of the strongest cards in this game, residing within his deck, with the biggest offenders being both his Gate Guardian and Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, which tops off at 4500 attack. And trust me when I say this, if he brings that out, you basically lose. There is absolutely no way to get over a Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon without a lot of luck. 
as you would need to combine the effort of multiple cards to even get rid of one blue eyes ultimate dragon. Because Priest Seto apparently has multiple of these, so even if you get rid of one, you should still stay on edge. Because blue eyes ultimate dragon is only the beginning of your worries. Because Seto 3rd has powerful cards in his deck, such as Regeki, Herpes Feather Duster, Widespread Ruin, and Shadow Spell, which can all be used to protect his own powerful monsters. And while dueling Seto 3rd, I did notice that the music was eerily familiar, and then it hit me. This theme is the same theme as Kaiba's theme from Yu-Gi-Oh! Monster Capsule Freedom Battle, which is a game I had covered in a previous iteration of Rogue the Master Duel, which I found incredibly cool as that was one of my favorite tracks from that game, and learning that it came back with its own Egyptian remix was incredibly cool to witness. Anyways, in my multiple attempts against fighting Seto 3rd, there was one thing that I learned when dueling him, which is that he's incredibly weak to widespread ruin, which can be used to easily get rid of threats right from the get-go. And this was a mistake that I had made since I had thrown away widespread ruin in one of my earlier games when I should have said it to get rid of Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, since the opponent in this game is always prone to summon the strongest monster in their hand. And yes, don't give him the chance to do anything if possible, as he will summon some of the most ridiculous monsters in this game. But seriously, the only way to win against Seto 3rd is to utilize equips and get your monster to the highest attack it can. And I can tell that he's very hard, because I wasn't the only one that had problems with him. All over the internet, I see cries for help in various forms, and even dedicated guides to beat Seto 3rd himself. And even though I thought this duel was ridiculous, as almost every attempt I've gone at him, he's utterly destroyed me. Even with a fully optimized deck, he's still a challenge. In the duel I had beat Seto in, I got incredibly lucky, as he didn't draw Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon once, and I had Widespread Ruin to back me up, followed by an Equit Spell and Umi on my very next turn making me be able to set up Twin Headed Thunder Dragon, which I had used to eventually beat Seto in a few turns. And after beating him, I can at least tell you one thing, we aren't done yet. After beating Seto, Seto was shocked that he had lost to you, realizing that he was the true third bright duelist after all. As Seto ponders, you finally get your hands on all 7 Millennium Items, and you are given a chance to destroy the Millennium Items. And as you are about to do that, Haishin sneaks up from behind and takes Seto hostage, holding a knife onto his throat, demanding the Pharaoh to give him the items or let Seto die as he tells us that he knew Seto's plans all along, and had only staged his defeat in order to figure out the true motives of Seto, as he knew that Seto was a descendant of the Dark Clan, and knew that he was necessary in order to begin the ritual. Then you are given a choice to give Haishin the Millennium Items or let Seto die, which really isn't a choice, as if you let Seto die, Haishin will mock you for testing his patience, and give you the same choice as before. So, it's the illusion of choice. Fun and the pharaoh hands over the millennium items to Haishin, bearing Seto's life, leading to Haishin finally being able to possess all 7 of the millennium items that he's been looking for, which was what he needed to summon the Dark Knight. And Haishin says that with the powers of darkness on his side, he will finally take over the world. And as Haishin places the last item inside of the tablet, a mysterious figure shows up out of nowhere. Dark Knight comes out of the tablet, and Haishin welcomes him and commands him to do his bidding, as that was what was written in the ancient path. And Dark Knight laughs and celebrates his return after thousands of years being sealed. He then expresses his disappointment at Haishin for barking orders at him, telling Haishin that he has sworn no allegiance to him and isn't compelled to obey his orders. Haishin complains and then pesters Dark Knight over and over again, until Dark Knight finally seals Haishin inside of a card stating that he looks better as a card, and he is also the most noisiest and ugliest card he's ever seen. Damn dude, that's a pretty good roast if I've ever seen one. Dark Knight then burns the card, killing Haishin in the process. Dark Knight then claims that he shall reclaim the power that he shared over the years, by killing every creature on this miserable planet, starting with both Priest Seto and the Pharaoh, as Dark Knight begins to turn both of them into cards for his personal deck. Seto quickly points out that the Pharaoh still has the Millennium Cards in his possession, that Yugi had passed on to him earlier, telling him to use those cards to send Dark Knight back to his own world. And the Pharaoh brings out the cards, proving that the ancient pact still exists. And Dark Knight acknowledges this, but he states that he intends to not go back empty handed. And Dark Knight gives them a chance, saying that it's only fair that their fates be decided by the cards. And thus begins the final duel of the game, with the Pharaoh dueling Dark Knight for his very survival. Dark Knight is the final boss of the game, 
everything we've worked towards, everything we've seen, everything we've experienced so far has led up to this point. Being the final boss of the game, his deck also contains some of the best cards Forbidden Memories has to offer, and Dark Knight contains a lot of magic and trap cards in his arsenal to counter almost any scenario that comes up, as he has almost every field spell which he likes to play, especially Mountain. Dark Knight also has all of the good normal magic cards like Rekeki, Dianketo, or Shadow Spell, and he even has Widespread Ruin and Reverse Trap, with Reverse Trap even being able to counter the equipped spells that we might use to defeat him. But luckily, he does not have Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, so we don't have to worry about that for this duel. But we still have to worry about the huge amount of magic cards in his deck, as a well timed Regeki can easily throw off your game, since he still virtually has every other good monster in this game, including Meteor Black Dragon. But even though I found Seto harder, I did not find this duel easy at all, as in my case, I had almost lost, as I had ripped badly and was forced to throw out Meteor Black Dragon early in order to survive, which was killed only 2 turns later by their Meteor Black Dragon, as Dark Knight had Shadow Spell, which could reduce the attack of a monster I controlled by 1000. And it came to the point where I would lose next turn if I didn't play anything good. As Dark Knight at that point already controlled both a Meteor Black Dragon and Cosmo Queen that were locked right at my life points. And that's when I drew my last lifeline, Megamorph alongside Dark Magician, giving me barely enough to overcome this situation. As the monsters in this game don't crash if they have the same attack points, effectively buying me enough time to make a powered up Twin Headed Thunder Dragon and eventually win the duel. Okay, there we go. Go for this first. Yeah, finish you with Dark Magician. Yeah, we're finishing him with Dark Magician. This is the final strike of the game! Geronimo! Geronimo! <laughs> Finally beat Dark Knight. This is not fair! Me? Me? I cannot lose! I created the cards! No! No! I cannot lose! What the fuck is that? There's another duel! There's another duel! What? What the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? Come, boy! One more time! One more game! There's one more duel! Who the fuck what? is that? Oh my god! Nightmare! Josh, what do you want to say? Oh god. <laughs> what do you god want to say, Josh? I'm just, I'm just depressed now. <laughs> give me, give me, give me a slogan. Anything. Um. <laughs> Yabba dabba doo. Yabba dabba doo. Nightmare is the final boss of Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, and he is the final opponent in the gauntlet. And yes, I'm sorry, I lied. Dark Knight is not the final boss of this game. It's Nightmare. And Nightmare is do or die. If we win here, we beat the game. If we lose here, we start back at square one. A lot is on the line here, especially considering how difficult the previous duels were, and Nightmare is no exception. Nightmare's deck is the most straightforward deck in Forbidden Memories, and ultimately one of the most powerful as well, as his deck consists solely of only monster cards, starting with the highest attack monster going down. Because of this, He'll always play a powerful monster no matter what, making him capable of killing you extremely fast, giving him the capacity to end duels very quickly, as he's got almost every high power monster this game has, and you'll need a lot of luck in order to beat him, as even with one blue eyes ultimate dragon being thrown down, can turn the tide of this duel very quickly, as it's just the luck of the draw when it comes down to Nightmare. And many have succeeded and many have failed upon the judgment of Nightmare. And now that I've come upon the same crossroads of fate that many people have come upon before, I now recall my past experiences and remember just how fun and challenging Forbidden Memories really was. And now filled with determination, I was prepared for anything he was about to throw at me as I was about to clench my teeth in preparation for the battle of my life. And the goddess of victory had shown upon me and Nightmare 
had bricked. I even got a pretty good opening hand, with Twin Headed Thunder Dragon and Megamorph just there, followed up by Umi next turn giving me a 4300 attack twin headed thunder dragon within 2 turns. And he didn't play a single blue eyes ultimate dragon, which could have ruined the entire duel for me. So I guess I got lucky, as I was able to set up traps after. And so with a 4300 attack twin headed thunder dragon, I was finally able to defeat Nightmare. And with Nightmare beaten, I can say that I finally beaten Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. Nightmare screams in agony as he vanishes out of existence and gets sealed up once again. And that day, Seto had left the ruins never to be seen again. And Egypt was unified once again under the rule of the pharaoh. And in order to protect mankind, he ordered the forbidden ruins to be buried. The prince had become the greatest of pharaohs, bringing prosperity to all that he had ruled. And as we end forbidden memories, we are told about a tale of the legendary pharaoh who saved the world, whom we call Yu-Gi-Oh. Eight months ago, I sat down and wrote a 36 page script for what was to be this review, and we finally caught up to where we are today. And now that it's been a while since I've actually written anything, I do want to talk about a few cool extras before closing off. While doing this retrospective on Forbidden Memories, I've been thoroughly invested in the various fan projects that people have been working on in relation to this game. And you know what? There's a lot of stuff out there. The modding scene for this game is one of the most active out there, and Tay Online seems to have a database for them as well, as most FM mods I know tend to rewrite the card drops in the game. However, there are a few quality of life mods that improve the game, and even add some challenge for those looking for it, with one of the most popular mods being the 15 card mod, which makes it so that 15 cards drop from one duel rather than one, making obtaining cards in this game a lot faster and fairer. And to be honest, if I were to play this game again, I would be utilizing this mod to make the game more fun. And I would recommend you install this mod too, if you are planning to give this game a spin, as not having to grind as much really does make this game more fun. One fan project that I've been keeping my eye on is called Memories Reborn, which is a full-fledged Forbidden Memories online multiplayer experience, which deems to improve upon the original. And I've actually played it for a bit, and it definitely shows a lot of promise, especially when compared to the original, as the multiplayer mode that's currently in Forbidden Memories isn't very good due to the hardware limitations that the game has. So if you want to try out some good old PvP, check out this game at some point, which may be out by the time you actually watch this review. As for my overall thoughts on this review, I know you might find me crazy for saying this, but I love the whole experience, and I think the difficulty spikes really mold this game into something special. Sure, it might not be for everybody, but for me, it was one of the best Yu-Gi-Oh games I had ever played, as my only complaint about this game was the grind. But this complaint can be mitigated through the addition of the 15 card mod, and I think that the gameplay relying on the new additions, such as the fusion mechanic and guardian stars, really helped drive home the experience, as I think that both the music and the atmosphere that this game provides are absolutely perfect, as the game's composition is one of the best video game soundtracks I have ever heard. And I really love the Egyptian atmosphere that this game is based around. Sure, it may have taken some liberties, but the game looks and feels like a console Yu-Gi-Oh game, and it shows from the vibe that this game gives off compared to the regular Yu-Gi-Oh TCG we might know today. And I'll never forget this memorable experience that I've had with this game, as experiencing it blind for the first time was ultimately just perfect. And while this long review is over, I'd like to depart with my head up high, as we still have other ventures waiting for us in the future. And without further ado, thanks for waiting for this video everyone, and thank you for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.